we are going to be talking about beryllium diffusion in sapphires. And this is leading on from last week's session where we discussed titanium diffusion. And in this session, if we cover the learning objectives, we're going to discuss what is diffusion treatment and then the method of how we diffuse beryllium into corundum and the effects of this treatment. And then of course, we're going to talk all about how we can identify this treatment. So to start off, what is diffusion? The scientific definition is the movement of atoms or molecules or ions into an area or from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So basically atoms spreading out. When we talk about diffusion in gemology and specifically diffusion treatment, uh, this is also known as lattice diffusion. Originally, this was known as surface diffusion and has also been called bulk diffusion. But when we're talking about diffusion treatment in gemology, we are specifically talking about external elements diffusing and moving into the gemstone itself. So um, this is all elements apart from oxygen and hydrogen, as these diffuse in and out of the stone during high temperature heat treatments. So when we're talking about diffusion treatment, we're talking about any other external elements apart from oxygen and hydrogen moving into the material. And what these have the ability to do is to drastically alter color. And in some occasions, it can also introduce optical phenomena into the gem as well. So um, these external elements that we refer to in diffusion treatments are ones that are not typically found in the gemstone in nature necessarily, such as beryllium. So let's just do a bit of an overview of diffusion treatments. So these were first seen commercially on the market in 1980, and these were titanium diffused sapphires. So this is what we covered in depth last week, and this is where we have the element of titanium, we diffuse it into sapphires that contain iron, and together those elements make pairs and we're creating really intense blue coloration. When it comes to titanium diffusion in corundum, this only goes a really shallow depth, and we discussed last week maximum depth is about half a millimetre, so 0.5 millimetres. But, well, a couple of decades ago, so in 2001, we had a different type of diffusion treatment come onto the market. The method of treatment is very much the same, it's just a different element we're diffusing into the gem, and this was beryllium. And with these beryllium diffused sapphires, um, this process really caused a stir in the industry and for us gemologists because this treatment is faster than any of the previous diffusion treatments. It can penetrate deeper into the stone and also it can create a whole host of really vivid and intense colors. So more really than any other treatment can do because we can make orange, pink, which is the Pad Paradsha colored stones, um, yellow, orange, red, or a mixture of these, so yellowy orange, orangey red, and blue. So really there's no other treatment that can create such a diverse range of colors. And on top of that, due to its um, deeper penetration of the element into the stone, it is actually harder to identify. So let's talk about how this came about. So I've already mentioned it was in 2001. Um, all of these Pad Paracha sapphires, which are these orangey pink sapphires, came onto the market in Thailand and at very modest prices. Now, uh, for anyone that's new to gemology, Pad Paracha sapphires, so our orangey pink sapphires, as shown here, although different people will have an idea of what true Pad Paracha is, um, these Pad Paracha sapphires are rare and they are expensive. In um, natural stones, they don't come across, you don't come across them very often, and they can be tens of thousands of dollars a carat. They can be very, very expensive stones. So when they appeared in high numbers and at modest prices on the market in Thailand at the end of 2001, suspicions were raised on what these stones are. So gemologists and laboratories took these stones in and started performing tests and experiments to find out 
what had happened to this stone, if they were synthetics or treatments or what happened. And they found that they could see lots of evidence of high temperature heat treated um, or heat treatment. They could see that the stones were sourced otherwise from a natural origin. And the only other thing that they could see on these stones was a yellow rim following the outline of the cut stone. But otherwise they couldn't find out what it was, but with extensive experimentation, they found out that it was beryllium that was being diffused into these stones. And very soon after all the pad parachids were noticed, where we saw lots of yellows, oranges, reds on the market as well. And these were often advertised as sunset sapphires, these lovely intense orangey red colors of sapphires. So a lab alert was sent out to the industry at the beginning of 2002 by AGTA Gem Testing Center, basically alerting everyone that there was a new treatment on the market and that we were trying our very best to find out how we can identify it. So what had happened? Where had all these stones come from? Uh, so this is a story that I've taken from uh, Ted Thamelis's book, which is all about beryllium diffused sapphires. Uh, I might be elaborating on the story a little bit, but where it all started, how this treatment was created, uh, it was actually by accident by a tie burner who was working to change the color of some Songia rubies. So these rubies were very stubborn in the fact that they would not change color with traditional heat treatments. And this can be quite common. So different corundums from different localities react differently to different treatments. So these ones from Songia in Tanzania were particularly stubborn. They were trying all sorts of different heat treatments and they couldn't get these dark purplish red rubies to change their color. But one tie burner pulled out of his furnace uh, these Songia rubies, which had all changed to these bright yellows, oranges, and red colors, which was fantastic. He wasn't quite sure what he'd done, but the results were brilliant. So he did it again and again. And upon changing trays or crucibles in the treatment process, suddenly the magic stopped. These stones weren't changing color anymore. And it was at that point he noticed on the tray that he had stopped using and that he switched out, to the tray that he was originally using, they noticed a little bit of chrysoberyl stuck and fused to, dip to this tray. And it was this chrysoberyl that was actually giving the source of beryllium, which was then diffusing into these stones during very high temperature heat treatment. So chrysoberyl has a beryllium content of around 7%, I believe, but you really don't need much beryllium to make a huge effect on the color of the resulting treated stone. So let's talk about the science of how um, beryllium does change the color of corundum. Uh, the first key thing about this treatment is, and diffusion in general actually, the first key thing is the high temperature heat treatment. The higher the temperature, the more the lattice of the corundum is able to expand and also vacancies are created within the lattice. And these vacancies are areas where there was an atom in a site but it is now vacant. And these vacancies allow other elements to diffuse and to move into the stone. So with these very high temperature heat treatments, we are able to diffuse beryllium into the stone. Beryllium itself is a very small atom. It has an atomic weight of four, but the iron that we actually diffuse in, so the specific beryllium iron is even smaller. So the iron that we're Diffusing is written here, so that's beryllium 2 plus. What that means is it's beryllium minus two electrons, so it has an overall charge of plus two, so it has a positive charge. Now these ions are even smaller and they're able to diffuse very easily and relatively fast uh, into and through the lattice. Now when beryllium diffuses into the lattice, it, uh, it has two main effects on the color of the stone. The first effect is that beryllium causes the color yellow. And the way it does this is as it's diffusing into the stone, it also creates its own vacancies and it pairs together. So it creates 
theta, well, it creates a color center known as beryllium holes, or also known as trapped hole color centers. And trapped hole color centers absorb light in the blue and transmit yellow color. So if there's beryllium in the structure, you're going to have these trapped hole color centers, and that causes yellow. That's the first thing that beryllium does. Second thing is beryllium can reduce the blue coloration in these stones. And it does this by replacing iron within iron and titanium pairs. So if we look at this chemical composition just here, so titanium and iron together, that is the color mechanism for blue within sapphire. Have a look at the iron for iron here, it's iron two plus. Beryllium 2 plus can easily be substituted for that iron, meaning that that pair, that blue mechanism is broken. So therefore not causing blue. So therefore, if we then have pairs of titanium beryllium, it's not causing blue. So therefore there is an overall reduction in the blue color when, th when these pairs are broken and replaced with beryllium. So that's the two things beryllium does within the structure, causes yellow and if, there are titanium iron pairs, it reduces the number of those pairs, reducing blue color. So let's talk about the method of how we uh, diffuse beryllium into the stone, starting with the starting material. So generally speaking, whenever we're doing these more extreme treatments on gemstones, uh, we normally use those stubborn gems I spoke about earlier, so those that aren't responding to other heat treatments. The reason that we do this is that heat treated stones that turn a nice colour on heat treatment alone are more rare and therefore more expensive on the trade. So typically we're only going to um, it's a very vague rule, but typically we do treat those that are otherwise unresponsive to typical traditional heat treatment. Some examples of these, I've already spoken about the dark purplish red rubies from Songia Tanzania. So the purplish is caused by blue coloration. So we're gonna try and reduce that blue in these stones. Also a great starting material would be heat treated colorless Gouda Sapphire. So with um, Gouda Sapphire, typically starts as colorless or white, we can heat treat those and they can turn blue if they contain the right chemical composition. So titanium and iron within their structure. If they don't, they don't change color, but they will be a perfect candidate for this beryllium treatment. Uh, another starting material that's commonly used are pale greenish sapphires. So these can be again from Songia or even Umba in Tanzania and Australia is a big source of these as well. Where green sapphires are very abundant and very cheap really on the trade. Um, and they're very common, they're the second most common color after blue in sapphires. Uh, most of these are routinely beryllium treated to turn them completely yellow, just as shown in this picture here, uh, because they're actually worth more as beryllium treated yellow stones than as their pale green starting colors. And another very common starting material would be pink sapphires. These commonly are from Madagascar, and these are the starting materials for the ones that become orangey pink. So your Padparadsha lookalikes. And that's because you have your pink core and then we're diffusing yellow in and those two colors together are that lovely orangey pink color. So talking about the treatment method, you'll actually see that this is really similar to the titanium diffusion. Just a different element is being diffused into the stone. Uh, but for beryllium diffusion, a slight difference where we can penetrate the beryllium further into the stone and cause color deeper into the stone, we can do this on rough material as well as cut, which as you'll see later can bring us some amazing easily identifiable features and some which aren't so easily identifiable. But first of all, we're gonna put it into a crucible with either powders that contain the coloring elements or into a flux, so the powders plus borax. 
and we're going to then heat it up. The powders or the flux do contain aluminium oxides and then there must be a source of beryllium. So either we can use beryllium oxide, so a much more pure form of beryllium, or we can use crushed up chrysoberyl, which often they use lower grade chrysoberyl, um, but it still has a content of about 7% beryllium. They then heat this up to really hot temperatures of around 1800 degrees to 1850 degrees Celsius, so approaching melting point of corundum. Uh, the melting point of corundum is 2045 degrees centigrade. And they'll heat this up for um, a period of time. It's relatively quick compared to other timings. I've got on the next page a whole list of how long it takes. Um, and then after it's done, they will have to polish the stones, even just a slight repolish, because these very high temperatures will actually cause pitting to occur on the surface. So how long does it take? So this is relatively quick compared to other diffusion treatments. If you remember from last week, titanium diffusion, these stones are treated anywhere between 200 and 400 hours um, at those very high temperatures. Uh, beryllium is quicker. So we can actually go one millimeter, which is twice the depth of all titanium diffusion treatments. Uh, we can do one millimeter in 10 hours at 1800 degrees centigrade, which is fast. We can actually uh, induce a really Wow, that's, it can make a big color change even just with that one millimeter depth. Then the longer time, and if we want to go further in, we have to really increase the time because penetration of this diffusion and diffusion depth is equal to the square root of time, not time itself. Basically means that we have to heat it up for much longer the deeper we want to go. So to go two millimeters, we have to heat it for 40 hours at 1800 degrees centigrade. And if we want to go just a little bit further, two and a half millimeters, this takes nearly 100 hours at 1800 degrees centigrade. So we can treat these stones in a relatively quick time and give a partial diffusion for those stones that might be orangey pink um, as a result. Or if we want to diffuse it all the way through, this is very possible, particularly on smaller stones, but it does take a lot longer. If we wanted it to do it on bigger stones, it could take a really long period of time to diffuse the beryllium all the way through, which, of course, the longer we're diffusing it at those very high sustained temperatures, it would be a very expensive treatment. So um, we don't diffuse them all the way through often if they're large. In regards to how much beryllium is actually within these stones, it's really low levels relatively. So uh, to impart a really intense color uh, on the stone, you only need about 10 beryllium ions per a million atoms. So very, very few can really change the color. So on average, it's anywhere between 10 and 35 parts per million atoms will be beryllium and it can completely change the color of those stones. When it comes to the different colors created by beryllium diffusion, I've got a little list here. We'll talk about what colors can be created from what starting material. So uh, the most popular ones really, are the ones that started, started um, you know, on the market with the orangey pink Padparacha lookalikes. This came from the pink Madagascan sapphires, and these are just partially diffused. So pink cores are still in existence with then that yellow beryllium outer layer. If we diffuse those fully or much further into the stone, so we have pink starting material, but diffuse it further into the stone, maybe 80% or above, we end up with an orange stone. So that's how we can make orange. We can make bright red by starting with our purplish red rubies like those from Songhia. Uh, these will actually be partially diffused again, which not only uh, increases some yellow color, but can cancel out those blue titanium and iron pairs. So reducing those blue tones in the stone, leaving a nice bright red. We can get an orangey red 
from this stone if this is also partially diffused and there's more of a yellow coloration. This can particularly happen if there's a lot of chromium in the stone. This can make it much more orangey looking, so an orangey red resulting stone. We can get golden yellow or some really lovely intense yellow colours by the starting materials, pale green, pale blue or even colourless like those from Sri Lanka, uh, green for Australia. Uh, these we can make yellow if we fully diffuse them with beryllium. They will go this lovely consistent bright golden yellow colour. And we can also make blue. The starting material for blue will be much darker blue, but again, the starting material is going to be that stubborn material that otherwise doesn't change with heat treatment alone. And we can partially diffuse this with beryllium, and that can break apart those or some of the titanium and iron pairs, reducing that blue body colour, making it a brighter blue as a result. I have an asterisk down here, as you can see, and that's to remind me to tell you that there is also a two-step treatment that can be performed on these blue stones. So after we've diffused them with beryllium, as I said, you break apart the pairs, reducing blue colour, but also this can introduce a yellow colour into the stone as well. Um, and that's if those yellow trapped whole colour centres are formed. What they might do to reduce this yellow tone, because otherwise you might have a greenish resulting stone, to re remove the yellow tone, they will heat the stone again. So subsequent heat treatment, this will be a really high temperature heat treatment again, but in a reducive, um, reducing atmosphere. So one with little oxygen. And this will actually allow hydrogen to diffuse back into the stone and it will break apart those trapped hold colour centres and remove the trapped hold colour centres, essentially removing the yellow colour and leaving a more colourless zone in the stone. I'll talk more about that later. I've got some photographs which will make that more clear. But just to let you know, there is a two step treatment that is possible for these blue stones. Let's talk about identification of these stones. Now, it does depend on whether they were treated in the cut or in the rough. This will affect what features we can see. Also, what's going to affect what we can see is whether it was only partially diffused or whether it was fully diffused. So we're going to start off by talking about those stones that were only partially diffused in their cut or preformed state. These ones are very common and these can be identified with observation. So what we're looking for when they're partially diffused in their cut state is this yellow to orange colour rim as shown in this photograph here. So uh, this material is at the moment immersed in diadomethane. So it doesn't really look like a gemstone, but I promise you it's a fully faceted gemstone just dipped into diadomethane. And that removes all reflections of any of the facet edges, allowing us to purely see into the stone and view any inclusions and colour zoning. And you can clearly see in this stone that we have uh, this pink core in the centre. And then following the shape and following the outline of the gem, we have this yellow rim or yellow to orange rim. This is also known as a rind. And this is indicating that we have this colouring element that is diffused into the cut stone. Normal uh, stones that have their colour from nature, so natural coloured stones, will not have any kind of colour zoning related to the cut shape of the stone. They'll have hexagonal zoning or random patchy zoning. But this is very clearly indicating that the colour has come in from the outside and just diffused in to that top millimetre or two into the stone. So that is a diagnostic feature of this treatment, but it can only be seen if it's partially diffused and if it was treated in the cut. So this is seen on orangey pink, orangey red and red beryllium diffused stones. You can see something similar in blue, but I have a slide later because where we've actually removed the yellow colour, you end up with a colourless rim on these stones instead. When it comes to uh, other colours, it does depend on the colour. So I have a selection on the left. These are mainly, as you can see, yellows, oranges, 
to red and then those orangey pinks as well. But on every one, you can see that you do have this color rim that's following the outline of the stone. On the opposite side, these are uh, sapphires that have not been treated. So these are all natural color zones. And you can see there's no relation at all with the cut shape of the stone. They're all just very randomly um, got these random patches of colors or hexagonal straight color zoning. When it comes to those stones that have been treated in the rough, these are harder to identify, but they still will have some features which indicate that they might have been uh, beryllium diffused. So if we have a look at this picture here, here is our material. It's been treated in the rough to go this orangey red color. Here it is once it's cut. And if we immerse it in diadomethane, we can still see that it has a color rim but it just doesn't follow the whole outline of the stone. But for it to color the stone somehow, it must be on one of the edges somewhere. So you might just see it on one or two edges of the stone. So you see this, what I call a partial rim. So running along one, two, or you know, several of the edges. So to see these observations, to see these color zones, these are best seen in diadomethane. So diadomethane is an irritant and it is a corrosive as well. Uh, but diadomethane does have an RI that crosses over with corundum. So it's an RI refractive index of 1.74. Uh, I have a picture of this exact stone in um, baby oil and you'll see that it's so much harder to see this diagnostic feature of the color rim which is why I would mainly advise even though it um, comes with a caution label this is certainly the best immersion fluid to use for this treatment. Whenever you're immersing anything the best way to do it is uh, to use transmitted light so through the gem and then some kind of um, diffusion plate or something so that the light diffuses. Uh, in this case, I've used a pot that is translucent so that diffuses the light nicely on top of a microscope. Uh, diadomethane goes in. I always use tongs so that I don't get my fingers on any of the fluid and you just pop your stone in and then you will clearly see this color rim on the stone with its core. Uh, this stone here is actually a pinky orange stone so that's why we see this pink core and then this orange to yellow rim. Uh, just in case, uh, I'd, when I first saw these pictures like this, I always wondered what was happening, whether I was looking at a cross section of a sapphire or something. Uh, but no, this is a fully faceted stone in diadomethane. This is exactly how it looks. It's quite phenomenal, really. Uh, just to show you, this was the titanium diffusion. Uh, someone asked me in the last session whether this beryllium diffusion has the color concentration to the facet edges? The answer is no, that is not a feature of beryllium diffusion, only of titanium diffusion. And that's because it's got that very, very shallow penetration along with the repolishing of the facet faces. Um, so that's a feature very much for titanium diffusion. You do not see that at all in beryllium diffusion because it's much deeper um, depth of diffusion. Just to show you then how uh, these stones look out of immersion and also in immersion of different fluids, because of course you're very keen to test at home. Uh, this is our material that we're testing. So this is my uh, orangey pinky uh, corundum here that has been diffused. This is what it looks like from the back. And as you can see, we can't see the orange or yellow color rim because we have this shadow running around the outside caused by the crown facets on the opposite side. If I put this in water, as pictured here, uh, this has reduced the amount of reflections on the stone. I can see into the stone more clearly, but nowhere near clear enough to be able to see that color rim because I still have these crown facet reflections here and there's shadowing happening here as well, really inhibiting my view of that color rim. Here is the same stone, but under baby oil. Baby oil has an RI of 1.45. Um, so this, again, a bit better. I also have lots of gas bubbles and things happening now. Um, but again, oh, you can just about see a color rim, but I wouldn't want to put money on it. You know, that 
bit too risky, I think, to say whether it definitely is or isn't brilliant diffused from this observation. And here is that same stone in diadomethane. So you can see how much clearer it is to see this feature. So I would recommend this fluid. Let's play a game. If you were with me last week, you'll know how to play. The game is diffused or not diffused. That is the question, and it's what I do with my time every Sunday. Now, uh, the way that we're going to play this round is uh, you can shout out at the screen, but just in case I don't hear you, if you put into the chat box D if you think it's diffused, or N if you think it's not diffused. Now, due to the nature of um, how hard this can be to identify, particularly if it's cut from the rough, I'll give you a clue. Any stones that are in these pictures that have been diffused would have been treated once they were cut. Okay, so there's nothing here that is um, been treated from the rough. That wouldn't be fair because that's a bit hard when you're starting out. Okay, so diffused or not diffused? Let's see, okay? Here's your first stone. So what do you reckon? Diffused or not diffused? Pop it into the comments. Oh, you guys know. Absolutely, you're all right, very good. It is diffused. Now this one was looks really pale, but you can still see that relation with that rim following the outline of the stone, so conforming to the shape of the stone, and then that central pink core. Very, very good. Let's do another one. There we go. You guys have got, most of you have got it. Very, very good. This one is not diffused, okay? Uh, if we have a look at this stone a bit closer then, so we have the yellow to orange coloration in patches within this center. This is possible, but not in diffusion treatment. We would expect most of it or some part of it to be running around the rim, but instead around the rim, we have the pale pink color. So this is actually not treated at all. Very, very good. Next one. Yeah, you know, you know it. It's diffused. This one shows a very clear pink core and then that um, oh, color rim of yellow to orange running around the center. And also this is really clearly showing you that it's much more intense at the very edges and then gets lighter as it's going in, but very, very good. And the last one. Yeah, you got it. Well done. Absolutely, this is not diffused. Very, very good. So again, um, for this one, especially where you've got two yellow color patches meeting each other, uh, if it was diffused, you'd have those other two sides coming in as well with that yellow coloration, but that's not there. Okay, but very, very good. So this one is not diffused. But granted, this is much harder than identifying titanium diffusion treatment, and it can only get harder if a stone has been fully diffused all the way through, or it's, if it's been diffused in the rough. These are the hard questions. We'll talk about ways that you can, that indicate this treatment for such stones, uh, in the upcoming slides. But before we do, I just want to talk to you a little bit more about the two-step treatment that I mentioned for blue. So these photographs are by John Emmett and they just show it perfectly. So this was our starting material here on the left. And then after beryllium diffusion, what happens is we have the reduction of color in the blue areas or in some places complete removal of the blue areas, this is due to the reduction in the number of titanium and iron pairs caused by beryllium. And then we also have this yellowish coloration, which can come into the stone, which is due to the trap hole color centers being formed due to the beryllium as well. So that's it after beryllium diffusion. <clears throat> but if they then subsequently heat treat this to a very high temperature but in a reductive atmosphere, so one with very little oxygen, um, it allows 
um, hydrogen to go back into the stone and actually cancel out those trap hole, trap hole color centers, meaning that the yellow is removed. So we can remove the yellow coloration with subsequent heat treatment. Okay, so forming nice bright blue stones with no yellow or greenish tint to them. These have their own color rim uh, or their own unique color rim and these are colorless due to this treatment. So here is a photograph of a stone in diadomethane. So it's immersed in diadomethane showing you this colorless rim. So that's an identifying feature for blue beryllium diffused stone. So let's talk more then about these difficulties in identifying beryllium diffusion. So in some cases, we can absolutely identify it, and that's if it's been partially diffused in its cut form, but we cannot identify these stones that have been fully diffused because they don't have a color rim. So that's not a feature in these stones. Also, it's a lot harder to be able to identify those stones that have been beryllium diffused in the rough because they don't have a full color rim following the shape of the cut stone. They may have a partial rim, which uh, sometimes might be more obvious than others. So you might be happy identifying it, or um, sometimes you might just wanna find some extra information or even send it to a lab if it's too difficult. So with all of these stones that otherwise are a bit hard to be able to tell whether they're diffused or not, we can look for other observational features that indicate that it's been subjected to very high heat treatments, which we'll cover next. And then your only other option is to send it for a lab, uh, to a lab. Now, laboratory testing is um, it's expensive because the equipment's very, very expensive. But for this treatment in particular, where the color mechanisms involved are so similar to some that can be found in nature, unfortunately, we can't identify all of these treated stones ourselves because they react the same with standard gemological equipment. So there we go. But let's talk about some other indications. So what we can look for in our stones to help build up some evidence that they might be beryllium diffused. Uh, one set of indications or oh, indicative features is all to do with high temperature heat treatment. So for example, heavily altered inclusions. This one, uh, this is a zircon halo. Now zircon halos, which are a zircon or another crystal with a stress crack around them can form in natural corundum as well. But if we see one of these zircon halos that has a white rim around the edge, this is telling us that the gem has uh, been under very high temperature heat treatment. Because what's happened is not only has uh, there been a stress crack around the crystal, but the crystal itself has melted and then recrystallized right in the outer edge of the discoid fracture. So if you see that white rim, that's telling you and indicating that the gem has been subjected to very high temperatures. Also, you can get these expanded or exploded crystals, also known as snowball inclusions. Um, so these are otherwise kind of um, formless masses within the stone where the, sto where the inclusion has expanded. Uh, these only occur in very high temperature situations as well. Also, we can find dotted silk. Uh, dotted silk, these are, are titanium oxide needles, so rutile needles, that have started to partially dissolve due to high temperatures. Uh, I believe this starts around 1500 degrees centigrade or Celsius. So again, very high temperatures, um, heat treatment, if you see this feature. Other things you might see in beryllium diffused sapphires are flux healed feathers. So we covered flux healing in sapphires a few weeks ago, uh, but where this treatment can take place within a flux, so with aluminium oxide and borate powders, um, as well as beryllium, there can actually be some partial healing of those fractures. So you end up seeing these white fluxy feathers within the stone. That's something that again indicates very high temperature heat treatment because flux healing only occurs around 1800 degrees as well. 
And then something else that you can see within these stones is synthetic overgrowth. I've got a picture of this in a couple of slides time, but again, due to just the high temperatures and sometimes the flux environment, you can get this synthetic overgrowth. And we also have blue halos around crystals which I've got a separate slide on as well. So let's talk about synthetic overgrowth for a little bit. So uh, this is really unique looking apparently on these stones. I have never seen it myself, uh, but what can happen is this synthetic overgrowth can form uh, due to those high temperatures or even that flux melt that they might get treated within. And the synthetic overgrowth, it can heal the fractures and then just start to grow some synthetic corundum on the surface as well. And some cut stones that have been beryllium diffused, they found that up to 10 or 20% of the stone is actually this synthetic overgrowth, which um, this is quite common apparently, but that's something that's quite concerning because, you know, if you're paying even natural or even treated prices for corundum, you, you don't want any part of it really to be synthetic. But to identify this synthetic overgrowth, it has this very unique blocky appearance. Uh, these are your hexagonal platelets of synthetic crystals that seem to overlap each other and have this very um, textured and almost geometric appearance to them. If you see in this picture, this is on a polished surface. So you can even see this with a polished surface. Uh, this will need to be under a microscope. I think this picture was about 25 or 30 times magnification, I think. Maybe don't quote me on that. Uh, and then uh, we have these blue halo inclusions. Now, blue halo inclusions, these are caused by internal diffusion of the elements with inside the crystal. So what's happened here is you have a crystal that contains titanium, maybe. So let's say it's rutile. And then during this high temperature heat treatment, it releases the titanium in a localized zone around the crystal. And if there's iron, present in that zone also, they will make those iron and titanium pairs and cause this localized blue coloration known as blue halos. And that's internal diffusion. Now, internal diffusion doesn't mean that the stone was beryllium diffused. This internal diffusion and these blue halos are actually quite common within high temperature heat treated blue sapphires. So just because you see this, you can't say it's beryllium treated, but it is diagnostic of a high temperature heat treatment. You can also see these blue halos within titanium diffused stones, as we talked about last week. But where this can be very, very helpful is in your yellow, orange, orangey pink and red stones. Uh, although these blue halos can occur in naturally, um, beg your pardon, in heat treated, naturally colored yellow, orange, and red stones can occur, it happens very, very rarely. So therefore, if you have a yellow, orange, or red stone with these blue halo inclusions, it is strongly indicative, very strongly indicative that these stones are beryllium diffused. Not 100% because it can occur in just heat treatment alone, but it's very highly suggestive. So if you see these, it's great great for your identification um, evidence. Other indicative features of these stones are their intense saturations. So here is a jewelry suite made out of beryllium diffused sapphires. You can see from this, well, these designs, why they're called sunset sapphires. I think they look great. But um, intense saturations, these are really common in beryllium diffused stones. Most of them react really well even with that small amount of beryllium even to a relatively small depth and they can create these really fantastic bright hit you in the face colors now uh, these colors are quite rare in nature and even in heat treated corundum these very strong saturations aren't that common so if you do see a lot of them at once or even just one large or very intense color, uh, straight away you should be suspicious that it might be a beryllium diffused stone, particularly if it's of those typical colors, and you will want to look into whether it could be beryllium diffused. For example, if it's a pale yellow, you don't really see pale yellow diffused stones, so they're probably fine. You see, so it's only those intense golden yellows that you have to worry about. So other things to note, 
or other things to take into consideration, we can uh, investigate a gemstone looking at it from the opposite side of the coin, so to speak. So we can look for features that indicate that it definitely isn't high temperature heat treated. Because if we can find evidence that it hasn't been treated with high temperatures, then there's no way it could have been beryllium diffused or diffused at all or flux healed because some of these treatments require these extreme temperatures. So features which tell you that it hasn't had high temperature heat treatments. Uh, one is silk. So if you do see intact rutile needles in your stone, that's telling you that it hasn't been heated above 1500 degrees. Typically, they, they can actually start to go at around 1200, I think. So if you see them, you know there's no way that your stone has been beryllium diffused. Another feature that you might see are two-phase carbon dioxide inclusions. So that's what's pictured here now. Uh, these two-phase carbon dioxide inclusions are really volatile. When these are heated up, even to 300 degrees centigrade, they can explode and crack the stone. It's amazing, really. Uh, these inclusions are really common in Sri Lankan stones. And actually, a lot of treaters will cut off any inclusion areas of these stones to risk you know, getting these away because they will destroy the stone if heated. Um, or they might drill into these inclusions just so that there's a space for the heated carbon dioxide to go so it doesn't crack and destroy the stone. So if you see these in the stone, that's a really good sign. It's actually telling you that no heat treatment has happened on the stone at all, which is fantastic, and that your stone is of natural colour. So that can be great. Also, you can look for a lack of altered inclusions. If you have whole crystals um, and like your rutile needles and everything that's not altered, then that can also suggest that your stone has not been treated to a high temperature. So we can gather evidence rather than looking for treatment evidence. We can look for lack of treatment evidence. So coming on to our final couple of slides now, let's talk about testing. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, beryllium diffusion cannot be identified by standard gemological equipment. So even your spectrums, you, you know, your red beryllium diffused, you still get a very, very similar chromium spectrum. And for the yellow stones, you still can see an iron spectrum. So sometimes, it, you know, it's not the clearest, but it still crosses over with what natural or heat treated stones can do. Same for fluorescence, same for dichroism, SG, everything. Unfortunately, there's nothing telling them apart. Even with advanced lab equipment, so all of the acronyms, the FTIR, the EDXRF, uh, the Raman microprobe, none of these can actually identify this treatment because beryllium is such a small element and we're dealing with such small volumes in the stone, uh, there's only three pieces of equipment that are able to identify this treatment. And that is the SIMS, the LIBS, and the LAICPMS. Now, uh, I can talk about the SIMS in a bit more depth. So the SIMS, this is a, a laser that fires onto the stone and this will knock ions off of the surface of the specimen which gets gathered in a mass spectrometer and then these will be separated by atomic weight and then counted so it can give quantitative data on really light elements. Now all of these pieces of equipment so they can identify the treatment but they're really expensive pieces of kit. Each one I believe to be fair, I haven't been in the market shopping for these recently, but at one point, I know 20 years ago from my research, these were anywhere up from a quarter of a million dollars up to $2 million each. So therefore not all labs have them, only specialized labs typically have them. And testing of your gem is expensive. You're talking about maybe several hundred dollars per gem, but it would be very important to have if you have an important stone that either you're wanting to buy for a lot of money or sell for a lot of money, you're going to need to get proof that it isn't beryllium diffused. Uh, here is a picture. This is 25 times magnification. This is showing you the damage, I believe, that a SIMS will do to the stone. So very, very minor damage. 
uh, just a slight area of the stone is taken away by the laser or you know blown off by the laser uh, this is to a depth of I think around 200 nanometers which is nothing a light repolish will get rid of that in two seconds uh, or they can also do it on the girdle so not to affect the stone. Uh, if it's present, you can see it with magnification. Uh, like I said, this picture by Shane McClure was taken, I think, at 25 times magnification. And just to finish off, we're going to talk about stability and disclosure of this treatment. This, tr um, <clears throat> this treatment is completely stable and permanent. So nothing's going to change the colour. It's not affected by light, chemicals, heat. It's very stable. By heat, it might change temporarily, like a few other um, corundum pieces can with a jeweler's torch, but it will return back to its original colour. And it is a permanent treatment. The only thing you have to watch out for is recutting the stone, because if it was partially diffused, and if you recut the stone, you could take away that yellow-orange rim, greatly affecting the overall appearance of the stone. In regards to disclosure, this is classed as a disclosable treatment, so a spe specific treatment that requires full disclosure at point of sale and also on lab reports if the lab's able to test for it. So at point of sale, you need to clearly label that it's beryllium heated, beryllium diffused, or color artificially given by beryllium, something along those lines to clearly label what the stone is because these are priced lesser than their natural or heat treated counterparts. On laboratory reports they'll also say whether it's beryllium diffused um, if they have the equipment. If they don't have the equipment what they often do is they'll have to say not tested with libs or not tested with sims to say that this is what I found out but I couldn't test for this treatment. Um, they'll also note down if there is any synthetic overgrowth on the stone or if there's any uh, evidence of it being heat treated with flux. So, and that's that. So just to cover those learning objectives that we did at the beginning. So diffusion treatment. So these are gemstones with a colour or sometimes with an optical effect uh, caused by the diffusion of chemical elements from an external source but with the exceptions of oxygen and hydrogen. So that is Sibjo's definition of a diffusion treatment and just saying that it's a specific treatment as in it must be disclosed. In regards to the method of treatment, so this is performed in very high temperatures, that's key to the treatment to allow the diffusion of beryllium, which can be diffused just partially into the stone if you only treat it for 10, 20 hours, or fully into the stone if you heat it for much longer times, 100 or 200 hours, you can fully diffuse the colour into the stone. And that will completely affect the colour that you end up with. So, well, the colour that you end up with is the chemical composition and starting colour of the stone, and then uh, the treatment time. So we can have a huge range of resulting products. So yellow, orange, orange, pink, red, and mixtures of those. So yellowy, orange, orangey, red, and also blue. And in regards to identification, we can identify this treatment for partially diffused stones in their cut state. We can see those yellow to orange color rims or colorless rim if it's a blue two-step diffused sapphire. If it's fully diffused or treated in the rough, it's a bit harder, but we can look for other evidence, such as evidence of high heat treatment, so a synthetic overgrowth, flux feathers, expanded or altered crystals and those blue crystals or those um, localized diffusion what did I just say internal diffusion so this localized blue zone around a crystal this is highly indicative of beryllium treatment if seen in yellow orange or red stones uh, so flux healing or synthetic overgrowth also evidence or it must get sent to a laboratory because they're the only ones with the pieces of kit that can positively identify this treatment or lack thereof. But that's it. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I've now got a quiz for you. Yay, I hear you cheering. Uh, question number one. What year was beryllium diffusion in corundum first seen on the market? Choices are 
1979, 1992 or 2001. Question number two. What is the main identification feature of beryllium diffused orange pink sapphires? So a clue is in the color there. An orange to yellow rim, a pink rim, or concentration of color along facet edges. Question number three, localized blue coloration around an inclusion, which is also known as internal diffusion, is diagnostic evidence of beryllium diffusion, titanium diffusion, or high temperature heat treatment? Key word in that question is diagnostic evidence. So, and then the last question, select all the tests that can identify beryllium diffusion. And I've gone for all the acronyms here. So UV Viz NRI, a Raman microprobe, a SIMS, an XRF, a LIBS, an LA ICP MS, a YMCA, an ABC, RSPCA. I honestly can't think of any others. There we go. So I'll give you just a minute to uh, finish off those questions and then we'll go through them as a group. I've just seen a question asking about whether this treatment affects um, bomite needles in some way. And from my research, like I can't, you know, I can't add everything into the slides, but from my research, I'm pretty sure that it does. I'm pretty sure it can almost hollow them out and they end up having this roiled appearance to them. Um, but there is, a, there's an article, so the GIA article, which is 50 pages long, but in 2003 on beryllium diffusion treatment is excellent. And I'm sure that they mention what can happen to burmite needles in there. So look that up. But great question. Thank you. Uh, the answer is yes. I know it has a royal appearance inside the needles. I believe they become hollow tubes or something. But, um, but yes, very good question. Um, but yes. Okay. I'll answer the questions in the question section in a second. I thought I'd just slip one in whilst we get these quizzes done. So otherwise, I'll give you just a few more seconds to submit your quizzes, and then we'll go through it as a group. I'm going to close the quiz now in five, four, three. But let's go through these questions. So what year was beryllium diffusion in corundum first seen on the market? Correct answer, 2001. Most of you got that correct. 1979 was the first um, testing into labs on titanium diffusion, which then really hit the commercial market in the 1980s. Uh, 1992 was actually uh, when flux healing came onto the market. So very good. Question two, the main identification feature of beryllium diffused orange pink sapphire is the yellow to orange rim. Very good, because uh, beryllium is introducing that yellow color. Excellent. Um, just it was a trick question or trick answer I did for C, concentration of color along facet edges. That is only a feature of titanium diffusion, not of beryllium diffusion. Okay, very good. Uh, question number three. This again, I wanted to see a bit of a trick question in a way. No, it's fine. Localized blue coloration around an inclusion is diagnostic evidence of high temperature heat treatment. That's the only thing it is absolutely positively telling you. It can occur in beryllium diffused stones. It can occur in titanium diffused stones. It can also occur in just high temperature, high heat treatment stones. So that is what it's telling you it definitely is. It might be one of the other things. However, if it is in yellow, orange or red stones, you, you, <laughs> it's very highly likely that it is a beryllium diffused sapphire if it's yellow, orange and red with that feature. And then question number four, select all the tests that can identify beryllium diffusion. The correct answers are SIMS, LIBS and the LA ICP MS laser ablation. Otherwise, very, very good. Well done, everyone. I'm just going to reshare the slide because I'm pretty sure otherwise it doesn't work for me. And now I invite your questions. So fire away and I will do my very best to answer them. Okay. Um, 
I have a question here, which they actually, you put in, Brian, hello. I believe you wrote this to me when um, the pictures of the stone in immersion were shown. And you asked me um, whether it would be easy to see if you looked down the vertical length or the length of the stone. The answer is you'll probably see something similar. And actually, if it's just a small core, it might, the whole thing might look yellow orange. So it actually might be harder. Um, the only other thing that I would say would be harder about it is diodomethane is quite expensive as a liquid. I only put as much liquid as I need into the immersion pot because if I had to put the length, I might have to fill it up a bit more and then try and stand it up on one end. Um, because, you know, I've never tried it, to be honest. It certainly still might show the feature. I wouldn't know. I don't think it would show it any clearer. I think the side or actually the table, um, table down view is, is probably the best. So I'm not sure it might work. I haven't tried it, but thank you very much for your question. I hope uh, that answered your question. Someone's asked me, what's the visual difference between beryllium diffused red sapphires and rubies? I've actually got quite a few here. They're really small. Uh, the main thing that I noticed from visual, although you would have to confirm it with tests, but from visual, they are super clear for clarity and they're really vibrant red, as opposed to most rubies are actually quite sleepy looking or have that pinkish tone to a lot of them. Um, so that would be my first notice for these uh, red ones. Also, they look really quite yellow from the side, um, but this can still cross over with everything that can occur in nature. But just from my own observations, that's the most things that I notice. Um, someone's written me a question, but in two halves, unfortunately, so I can't see it all at once. Someone's asked me, is diffusion only done in corundum, or are there any known and reported cases of this procedure being applied in other gem species? Yes, there is a very popular case of diffusion occurring within andesine feldspar. This is the diffusion of copper within otherwise um, colorless labradorite feldspar causing a uh, surface diffusion. So actually it's quite easy to identify, I think, from memory, because it uh, concentrates along the facet edges. But um, in regards to diffusion, have a look for andesine, feldspar, that's diffused and it's red in color, like a brownish red. Also, I've read, I'm not quite sure how accurate it was actually, but apparently topaz can be surf like diffused as well with different elements. But otherwise that's it that I'm aware of because um, it's all to do with the chemistry. So it depends, you know, how tight all the bonds are within the structure and what could be replaced by the diffused ions and if the lattice will allow those ions in in the first place. Or even if um, the gem can take such a high temperature heat treatment in the first place. So it's not possible on everything. But um, that would be my answer. Andesine feldspar and possibly topaz. Will the results be the same in different gems? No. You can see that even the results are different in sapphire from one locality to another. We have differences because it's all to do with the chemical composition. As soon as you switch gems, I would, you know, you'd have to look into the specific features for a different gem. Okay, but there we go. Let's pause it there, but I will continue answering questions after otherwise that's it from me thank you so much for joining us today if you want to keep on top of when things are open and announced and when registration opens please do subscribe to our websites that is the best way to find out what's going on so that's joryadvisor.com if you'd like to follow me and my lectures or gemme.com as well we also put them on our social media so on facebook on instagram and on linkedin so follow those and you'll see when things open because we often put that within our stories if you have to go, but you want to ask me a question or send me a message, feel free to do so and email me directly, julia at juryadvisor.com, or send me a message on Facebook, Instagram, write a comment on Facebook, we can start a big conversation, it'll be fantastic. So uh, yes, if you'd like to contact me further. But otherwise, that's all from me today. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for your support as well in coming to these webinars. I hope that you learn a thing or two. But most of all, I hope you enjoyed yourself. So otherwise, have a great rest of your Wednesday and I'll see you in a couple of weeks time. Take care.